Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, today's, present, uh, today's presenter is Dr. Yumna Saftar. Uh, she is an uh, uh, urology resident at SIUT. She will be discussing about the indication types and surgical techniques and complications of RP landing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yasser. <coughs> Uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone and Ramzan Mubarak. This is the first presentation of Ramzan Kareem and a continuation of the topic of testicular tumors. So today I will be discussing retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, which is a treatment modality of, a, uh, of testicular tumors. So first of all, we need to know what are the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. As you can see in the diagram, uh, there is a uh, 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 um, inferior vena cava and aorta and and the number one region this is this region is the paracaval lymph nodes uh, or on the anterior side of the ivc are the precaval lymph nodes between aorta and inferior vena cava is the interaortocaval region on the anterior side of the aorta is the preaortic region and then the rest are the iliac regions so this is uh, these regions make up the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. So the, today the learning objectives of my presentations are the indications of retroperitoneal lymph node dissections, types, surgical techniques, and the complications. So the indications of the RPLND according to NCC and guidelines of 2020 are uh, stage one. As the, this has been already discussed in the non-seminal metals germ cell tumor lecture which we have already attended. Uh, so it's the stage one and stage two non-seminometous germ cell tumors. It is the primary treatment of a stage one or two tumor, uh, stage one or two tumors with transformed teratoma and stage two tumors with teratoma predominance if the serum tumor markers are normal. So this is the stage one, basically uh, T1 to four with N0, you see? Uh, the lymph nodes are, are N0, the, that is there are no uh, lymph nodes present no uh, on the CT scan. But still we are doing retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in a stage 1 disease. And then there is a stage 2A and 2B. Uh, you see the limit, is, the limit is N1. N1 means less than 2 centimeter mass and less than 5 or fewer positive nodes. Beyond that, we do not perform RPLNDs. You see, uh, stage one, it, this is the um, algorithm of the non seminomatous germ cell tumors of NCCN guidelines. Stage one without risk factors. So there are three treatment modalities, one of them which is nerve sparing RPLND. What are the risk factors? Um, and then uh, stage one with the risk factors. Also, uh, it's surveillance, chemotherapy, or nerve sparing RPLND. So, what are the risk factors? Risk factors are lymphovascular invasion, invasion of the spermatic cord, or invasion of the scrota. Now, moving on to stage two. Stage two A, if the markers are negative, the primary treatment is nerve sparing RPLND. And stay in a stage two B. Again, there we have a choice of chemotherapy and nerve sparing RPLND. As our topic is RPLND, so we are focusing on the indications of RPLND, which is now, which is very clear that it's stage one till stage two A of non seminomatous germ cell tumors. Then this is the post chemotherapy RPLND algorithm in which stage two A and stage two B are treated with <coughs> primarily with primarily they are treated with chemotherapy. And then we repeated an abdominal uh, uh, CT cap. And then for a res residual mass of greater than one centimeter, or even for a residual mass of less than one centimeter, we perform nerve sparing bilateral RPLND. Though for a mass of less than one centimeter, we also have an option of surveillance, but, but post chemotherapy, if the residual mass is greater than one centimeter, we go for nerve sparing bilateral RPLND. There are, however, some relative contraindications. Uh, abnormal serum levels of serum tumor markers after orchidectomy. If there is pure seminoma, there, there is a bulky retroperitoneal lymph adenopathy. That is clinical stage greater than 2B. I have already um, described it. That uh, two, uh, 
टू बी इन्वॉल्व द डिजीज अप टू एन वन स्टेज एन वन मीन्स ग्रेटर देन टू सेंटीमीटर मैथ और लेस देन और इक्वल टू फाइव और फ्यूअर लिम्फ नोट बियॉन्ड दैट आर पी एल एन डी इज नॉट इंडिकेटेड so you know if you go back to the previous slide now still uh, in these two slides uh, when you were actually telling us about uh, the indications of rplnd it as you have said it is very clear that uh, whether the tumor markers are significantly raised or if they are negative uh, serum markers even then for stage 1 and stage 2a we we, uh, we must do um rplnd but still we can't see anything in terms of pet scan now what in these days is complicating the whole picture is the advent of pet scan and someone says that maybe the uh, serum markers are negative but the pet scan is uh, is actively evident on the retroperitoneal space so let's do something so still uh, this is for all of us to understand that pet scan is something to add up in the post chemotherapy setting but in the pre chemotherapy setting uh, even if pet scan is not available it doesn't stop you thinking and doing something in terms of retroperitoneal space so this is a message for all of us if the pet scan is not available in any part of the world maybe in many centers of pakistan they shouldn't stop thinking in uh, uh, in giving the advantage of retroperitoneal lymph node dissection to to their patients right but you only talk about pet scan in the post chemotherapy settings as there is uh, in stage 1 there are no lymph nodes n is zero but still we perform template dissection of retroperitoneal lymph nodes yes i hope everybody understood that so now we are moving on to the relative contraindications um okay so i have discussed the uh, three mentioned above and uh, the last one is obviously the comorbid conditions that uh, does not allow for general anesthesia now moving on to the types of rplnd so there are various types according to the campbell urology first of all it's the primary rplnd uh the indications of which i have discussed with the nccn guideline that is after orchidectomy uh it's clinical stage 1 or low volume clinical stage 2 low volume means that n is 1 right L lymph nodal mass is less than 2 cm or the positive nodes are 5 or fewer with normal serum tumor markers so this is the primary rplnd rest of the things are a bit more complicated one is the post chemotherapy rplnd post chemotherapy i have already discussed it's referred to the rplnd that is performed after an induction chemotherapy induction chemotherapy means a uh, treatment with chemotherapeutic agent first line chemotherapeutic agents <laughs> and this is often performed where there is a residual mass of greater than 1 cm as this was mentioned in the nccn guidelines and the post uh, chemotherapy serum tumor markers are normal i have already discussed that if the mass is great less than 1 cm post chemotherapy then we have an option of surveillance or nerve sparing rplnd then there is another one called selfage post chemotherapy rplnd in which the rplnd is performed after both induction and selfage chemotherapy so induction i have told you that induction is uh, treating treatment with chemotherapeutic agents uh The, the, those are the first line chemotherapy indications and the selfage chemotherapy is when all other agents have failed so the chemotherapy given is called the selfage chemotherapy when rest of the treatments are failed so after selfage chemotherapy there is a role of selfage post chemotherapy rplnd and then there is another one called desperation post chemotherapy rplnd in which there are elevated serum tumor markers uh before that the types i have discussed unke in the prerequisite tha that serum tumor markers should be normal but this desperation post chemotherapy rplnd calls for rplnd even when there is elevated serum tumor markers then there is reoperative rplnd in which we have performed an rplnd before and then there, there is a resection of re late relapse so late relapse is defined as after 2 years after complete response 
So if a patient is coming with a, a disease after two years, and then we are doing RPLND, so that is called resection of the late relapse. <coughs> now moving on towards the surgery, what are the prerequisites? <coughs> so the CT scan should be within the six weeks of surgery and serum tumor marker should be of uh, not uh, more than of uh, seven to 10 days. Yani 10 days is other purane serum tumor markers nahi hone chahiye. Agar kisi ko bleomycin mil chuki hai, if, if bleomycin has been given in post chemotherapy RPLND patients, so uske liye chest CT scan should be there. And what we don't have here in Pakistan is preoperative sperm banking that also has a role. And as Dr. Asad added that PET scan is also necessary if we are going for a post chemotherapy RPLND. So now, uh, before understanding the surgery, we need to understand the uh, tumor spread, which is different for the right and the left side. So you see, this is the right side, and uh, here the spread is like. Most of the spread is in the inter aortocaval space, that is 88%. And then second is the pre caval and then pre aortic and then downwards. So the most common lending site for a right sided testicular tumor is inter aortocaval lymph nodes, which make up the 88% of the bulk. And if you go for the left, Testicular tumor spread, the most common region is paraaortic. You see, paraaortic, it's 79%, and then it's pre aortic, that is 71%. Both of them, uh, aorta uh, makes the major bulk, and then there are common iliacs, and then there is uh, caval lymph nodes. So the primary landing site for the left testes is the paraaortic area at the level of left renal hilum. So you see the right testicular spread is in the inter cable region and the left is mainly in the aortic region. Now, something about techniques. Uh, we have three modalities, open and minimally invasive. Minimally invasive includes laparoscopic and obviously robotic. Uh, in most centers of the world, uh, still open RPLND is the gold standard. There are some centers who are performing laparoscopic, which is difficult, and uh, few have started doing robot-assisted RPLNDs. So, <clears throat> again, uh, go back to the previous two slides. Um, now, uh, this landing site of right and left testes is actually the concept behind uh, the template dissection. So, if uh, you uh, have a have a patient with a right testicular tumor, and you are in the process of doing um, uh, a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, then the template should include, uh, as you can see, for instance, if you draw the lines, then it can spare the common iliac uh, on and the bifurcation of aorta on the left side, but maybe the whole um, uh, region below the uh, renal hilum on both sides as well as the midline is uh, has to be taken into account so that is the template of for the right testicular tumor and that should be kept in mind the second one is this one when the landing site for the left testicular tumor is primarily on the left side uh, uh, pre aortic and para aortic and uh, you can spare the right one you can spare us anything which is in, in the front of uh, inferior vena cava as well as on the side of inferior vena cava, that is the lateral side. Again, it should be below the uh, renal hilum on the left side. So, so th that makes a very good kind of um, um, a logic behind doing a template dissection. Unless or until you do a template dissection, you, you cannot label your dissection process as having uh, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. So you can't use this term unless and until you do a template dissection. So as we do open RPLND is in our setup, the position of the patient is in the supine position with arms in a T position slightly below a 90 degree angle. And the incision is midline transabdominal incision. For low stage disease, bowels are retracted within the abdomen and for a high stage disease, complete mobilization of the right colon and the left colon, and cauterization of duodenum and inferior border of pancreas, everything is mobilized completely. 
next is the picture of the mobilization of the colon in which the white line is mobilized and uh, the right colon is retracted and there is uh, you can see aorta and inferior vena cava and the lymph nodal anatomy basically this is the uh, the standard mobilization of the colon in the uh, standard bilateral lymph node dissection what we do that the we mobilize uh, gut from the root of the mesentery we mobilize from root of the mesentery going downward and we, then we mobilize the cecum again on the right side we open the line up towards it, up to the forearm uh, forearm and abdomen slow this is how we mobilize the gut for the standard bilateral rplnd and we push the gut uh, up, upward and then we do the dissection <clears throat> so dr yasser has already explained the technique uh, it's called split and roll the after mobilization of the gut we start at the level of uh, uh, left renal vein um, and it's a top down approach a very important thing is to uh, identify the superior hypogastric plexus the superior hypogastric plexus lies anterior to the aorta so we need to um, preserve the post ganglionic sympathetic nerves to preserve the ejaculatory function of the patient so the split is started at the 12 o'clock position at the aorta as you can see this is the split that is starting at the aorta in the 12 o'clock position below the renal hilum and this plane is uh, continued to dissect till the inferior mesenteric artery where the superior hypogastric plexus is located so yeah uh, is kendar jo hai this is the inferior mesenteric uh, artery and this is the superior hypogastric plexus uh, that is formed by l1 to l4 in which the l2 l3 are fused and this is the nerve pathways for emission and ejaculation uh, emission is uh, the um, deposition of semen in the posterior urethra and ejaculation is um, moving of the semen outside of the body so if we mess up this plexus we lose this function the anatomy of the four post ganglionic efferent sympathetic fibers l1 through l l4 <laughs> involved in the anti grade ejaculation are very variable in different uh, patients however mostly the anatomical variation that we find is the fusion of l2 and l3 vertebrae uh, l2 uh, and l l3 post ganglionic sympathetic fibers <clears throat> on the right side as you can see the sympathetic chain uh, lies directly behind the inferior vena cava and on the left side the sympathetic chain is uh, lateral and posterior to the lateral border of the aorta basically we have to save the pre ganglionic fiber arising from the l1 l2 3 <clears throat> so this is a close up look in which the lumbar arteries are ligated and uh, this is the right side uh, of the patient these are the uh, lumbar arteries that have been ligated and the plexus has been taken on uh, a nylon sling to uh, for preservation this is what this was the most common anatomical variation i was talking about fused l2 and l3 and then uh, l1 this is the sympath uh, sympathetic chain that needs to be preserved in the nerve sparing rplnd nerve sparing rplnd mean basically means sparing of the hypogastric plexus however if there is a doubt about resectability complete excision of the tumor always takes precedence over nerve preservation that if the nerves are involved by tumor or if you are suspicious that the mass is not completely removed then we have to sacrifice the nerve so patient has to be explained beforehand uh, for the retrograde ejaculation or the loss of this function and i think that that is the principle behind uh, um anything uh, any procedure that involves nerve sparing uh, in brackets because uh, whenever nerve sparing radical prostatectomy is being proposed or nerve sparing um retroperitoneal dissection is being proposed then we must weigh uh, the uh, benefits of uh, leaving behind or or not leaving behind the tumor for instance you are doing all this for the sake of uh, uh, giving your patient uh, a survival benefit a, a patient with a life of uh, having no tumor in the body but if you are preserving the nerves just for the sake of uh, preserving the sympathetic supply 
then this is not a good bargain. So again, uh, if you are dealing with prostate and there is a tumor which is on the periphery, right side or left side, now that side of the that um, of the nerve plexus um, is, is actually severed, is actually sacrificed, and uh, that is kind of a, a, a principle that we apply here also. So um, if there is a bulky tumor, and if the nerves cannot be saved, then we have to uh, sacrifice the nerves just to take out the tumor, which is the mainstay. So the mainstay should be in 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 front of us, not the other other things. Other things comes next. So as I uh, previously mentioned uh, about the open RPLND technique and there are a laparoscopic version and the robotic version. I'm not going into details of those because these are not performed in our centers, but that is performed worldwide. So you should know. So now moving on to the template dissection. As Professor Asad has already told that the templates are based on the uh, landing site of the tumor, the, which is different for the right testes, that is um, the interaortic cable region, and the different for the left testes, which is uh, the aortic region. So uh, the current standard approach is full bilateral nerve sparing dissection in all patients, regardless of the stage. So the template um, that is standardly practiced uh, worldwide is full bilateral approach because there is a risk of uh, contraindication, uh, uh, contralateral residual disease, or there is a risk of um, later uh, um, positive lymph nodes after surgery. So most of the times the standard approach is the uh, bilateral approach. However, if the uh, surgeon is too confident or if uh, if they don't want uh, much of the work uh, to be done, or if they are very confident that the disease is localized on the right side or the left side. So uh, the templates that were um, described by Whitmore are the modified left-sided procedure, in which, uh, as you know, the left, uh, landing site of the left tumor is uh, pre-aortic and para-aortic. So you can see in this template that Renum, renal hilum is involved superiorly and the left ureter is uh, the boundary laterally. The medial border of the IVC from the level of the renal hilum to the inferior mesenteric artery and the lateral border of the lower aorta and common iliac artery to the level of its bifurcation, thus encompassing the left paraaortic and inter aortocable regions. Now, this is the region, as I've already told, involves the inferior mesenteric artery. This is the region where the superior hypogastric plexus is in for, uh, uh, involved. And this is um, this is the place uh, where if you, if you go down there and if you do not identify nerves and you cut down the nerves, then you lose the ejaculatory uh, function. So there are also more modified versions in which uh, the surgeons do not like to go up to here that is caudal to the inferior mesenteric artery. But these are not uh, these surgeries are not performed or not considered standard. These are up to the patient and the surgeon preference. Just a word about uh, this modified technique. Um, now, this uh, topic has been uh, under discussion if you are interested in it uh, in the literature for many, many years. Uh, what the statistics have given us is uh, one thing, and that is if the disease is on the right side, that is the right testicle is involved, then most probably there is always a crossover of the disease on the left side. So that is the reason why both the uh, both the sides are taken with if the disease is on the right side. But if it happens to be on the left side, that the left testicle is involved, then in many of the cases, uh, the crossover on the right side is not there. So you you if you stay on the left side, uh, with a modified template, uh, you can have a justification. Uh, for instance, in, in in this diagram, which is D diagram. So um, uh, th this is the kind of uh, uh, discussion that that can always uh, be taken into consideration whenever you have got a very large series of uh, uh, patients and uh, dissections done 
in one center, which happens to be a tertiary care center and a referral center for the whole region or maybe the whole country. Uh, we cannot follow all these kind of modifications unless and until we have got a very high volume practice of this kind of surgery. Still, we do these kind of surgeries and uh, for instance, maybe uh, once every week, but that is not enough. Um, in America, the Sloan Catering Center is doing it probably 365 days in a year. So uh, they have got a different kind of approach and they can do all these modifications. Um, but I, I am still um, in doubt that uh, we should embark upon this kind of approach. So till such time that uh, we reach to that point, um, we must stay with the classical template. And that is my, my assumption. I, I think this is, an, this is open to discussion, all, all seniors who are doing it. So now uh, the boundaries for the right-sided uh, modified template, it's the right hilum uh, superiorly and the right ureter laterally and the lateral border of the aorta between the level of renal hilum and inferior mesenteric artery and the lateral border of the common iliac artery to the level it's, of its bifurcation. So it involves the uh, inter aortocable region, which is the main landing site of the right testicular tumor. So there are further modifications in which you see uh, they have skipped the inferior mesenteric uh, artery part just to preserve the superior hypogastric plexus so as not to mess up with the function of ejaculation and emission. Now, the complications associated with RPLND is uh, one of the major complications is lymph leak as we go into more and uh, more dissection around the arteries and the veins. So lymph is bound to leak. One way of preventing this is to identify the lymphatics and tie them. Uh, the other one is a bleeding bowel injury, solid organ injury that can happen in any surgery. Nerve injury of superior hypogastric plexus that, is, uh, that leads to retrograde ejaculation. Chylus ascites, whenever there is lymph leak and it's off to such extent that it develops ascites, it's 1 to 3 percent. Renovascular injury is 1 to 3 percent. Patient can go into small bowel obstruction 1 to 3 percent of their times. And then there is spinal cord ischemia, which is a very rare complication, but it's reported. And then there are wound infection, UTI, and ileus. So these are the complications of retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. This presentation was made from Campbell Walsh Urology 12th edition and Operative Urology at Cleveland Clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yumna, uh, for such a nice and uh, nice presentation. So unfortunately, the RPLND is not being performed in many centers of this country. I mean, the centers where RPLND is being performed, I'm not sure whether they are doing the standard approach or not. Therefore, it's very rare for us. We Most of our residents are not familiar with the template and how to approach. But this is the way and this should be performed. Yes, explained by Dr. Yeah, yes, uh, I think th this is a very difficult kind of a subject. And uh, many of the times uh, uh, when I was a student at uh, your age, uh, um, many of my colleagues uh, used to skip this this chapter. And uh, there, there was no uh, examiner um, uh, who confronted us at that time who used to ask anything about testicular tumor. So testicular tumor was something which uh, whenever comes into examination as part of uh, theory examination, it was uh, for the sake of uh, um, making it more difficult rather than a very easy kind of a subject. But still, uh, we have got a lot of... Um, room to play, room to play in a sense that uh, this is something which is on the rise. This is something which uh, was not so common when maybe 25 years back uh, again in uh, 80s and 90s. But with the advancement of uh, a lot of things, uh, maybe the, uh, the technology that is available to us and maybe the awareness which is there in, in the public, uh, the people do come with uh, this kind of disease in uh, in the early stages, um, mainly these patients, they, they fall in uh, the lap of two people. One is the urologist, the other one is the 
general surgeon now even if you are a general surgeon uh, the subject has to be known to everybody uh, because if you do a very good um, inguinal approach or chiectomy radical or chiectomy and you don't think about uh, the kind of report that is available to you whether it's seminoma or non seminoma and you don't do any serum markers and you don't do any ct scan because with ct scan um you always want to see what's happening uh, in the abdomen in the aortocable area uh, whether there are any lymph nodes or lymph node masses there or not so the subject has to be there at the back of the mind of everybody whether a general urologist or a very special uh, uro oncologist uh coming back to the same uh, problem that uh, how do we take this subject uh, still on on a slightly um better uh, way uh, i think uh, the whole community of doctors uh, particularly urologists junior seniors has to uh, do a lot of thinking they have to um read the subject because now it has been uh, um, gone on to such a stage that they that they are fine tunings uh, i just give you an example robotic surgery was uh, mentioned uh, there was a person from england when we started with da vinci 3 uh, years 2 years back and she happened to be a lady archana was her name and she was doing at that time only kidney surgery um robotically um two years three years down the line she happens to be in guys in st thomas hospital now she has been uh, given the opportunity of doing only retroperitoneal lymph node dissection robotically so this is the kind of uh, um, concentration and focusing that they can do put one person who is a very accomplished surgeon doing only one thing and she i think she will be able to save nerves she will be able to see nerves she will be able to do uh, justice to all these modifications in the retroperitoneal space and she will be the right person to do anything the same kind of approach can be applied for us also uh, for instance if we take our unit that has got the availability of robot we can have uh, two or three teams doing different things maybe upper tract lower tract retroperitoneal space somebody so th- this is uh, the kind of uh, uh, wish that i i have and uh, it needs a lot of thinking but uh, still this subject needs uh, justification in terms of um, reading in terms of uh, applying the uh, the knowledge that is available the ncc and guidelines and one thing has to be clear that this is not a job for every uh, every center to do you got to have centers where everything is referred so that their volume is increased and their expertise is increased they can give they can give you then good results uh, noman if you you want to say something because you have skipped your seat from back to front the uh, salam very nice presentation by dr yumna uh, very well presented the bilateral templates uh, i just uh, sir after reading a lot of material i am just uh, still want to ask question to the board and to you is the tumor is, is responsible for the uh, bladder like incontinence or retrograde ejaculation or it is a surgery which can cause surgery can cause it, it is understandable but somewhere in the text it is written that the, the primary tumor it can also cause infertility bladder incontinence and uh, retrograde ejaculation because of the presence of tumor in the hypogastric plexus number one is uh, this is my question and the second thing is that uh, there is a, uh, there is a, the thing uh, described by dr yasid about uh, rplnd and residual mass exchange you have just recently shared the paper uh, both have comparable results uh, uh, when you go uh, retro uh, retro peritoneum uh, transmesenterically or uh, the uh, and you dissect the residual mass only and uh, you are not able to do the whole lymph node dissection uh, considering the uh, recent studies or the uh, complications of that surgery it is comparable but uh, uh, to some extent uh, in that paper they have written that the recurrence uh, is at one year or five year is uh, more in uh, residual uh, mass excision or lumpectomy or metastatectomy 
then uh, bilateral uh, retropatellar lymph node dissection right so uh, coming back to the first part of your question you see there are three kind of uh, nerve injuries that can happen anywhere in the body for any kind of a nerve one is uh, um, axonotmesis the second one is neurotmesis and the third one is neuropraxia so if uh, the tumor is there or if anything is there um, uh, in the retroperitoneal space what i can assume is uh, it's the mass effect of the tumor uh, which can alter the nerve conduction. It can also uh, cause the nerves to uh, stop functioning properly. Uh, so it is as good as having something which is like sympathectomy. So you see, whether you do it by doing a dissection or you do it by just leaving behind a tumor, pressing onto the nerves, it's the same thing. It's the same thing in terms of having a non-functional sphincter, uh, internal sphincter as well as external sphincter, which is the basis of incontinence at the bladder, uh, bladder base. So uh, that is an assumption. Again, I cannot prove my assumption, uh, but uh, still I can think that maybe this is the kind of approach. Uh, what, what this uh, sympathectomy also gives you is something which is uh, beyond bladder, is something which is uh, which might be portrayed to different other organs. For instance, there, there is the intestine, uh, there are other uh, glandular structures. So uh, this is not only a sympathetic nerve, it's the different kind of a ganglia that have been ex uh, explained. For instance, the celiac ganglion. If you um, just uh, uh, disturb the celiac plexus, then uh, you, you can have a, a very different kind of a, a GI system working um, at hand. So that, that is the first part of uh, your question, the answer to the first part. The second part of your question was about, uh, about lumpectomy and uh, the retroperitoneal dissection. You, you see, this kind of discussion we had uh, a week back also. And uh, uh, both the things have got their own value. Lumpectomy is not inferior so that we can put it in a waste basket. It has got its own value. Again, it is something which is not a lumpectomy as such. It is a residual disease. Now that definition, that clarification has to be clear again. It is a residual disease, which is a residue after chemotherapy. So it's a post chemotherapeutic residue. If you leave it behind, and you do a PET scan, which again complicates the picture because of a lot of surround sound and a surround effect, then you will be again in a confusion because it can give you avid picture, it can give you a non avid picture. Maybe it's metabolically active, maybe it's not metabolically, metabolically active at the present time. Later, it can become active. So you see, uh, if anything is there in terms of mass, just minus PET scan. Just concentrate on your technical skills. You can provide a benefit, survival benefit to your patient. Unless and until we increase our capacity to do a pr proper job as, as, uh, as surgeons, we cannot expect the oncologist to give you good results, the medical oncologist. So uh, the journey has to be, uh, um, say, done on both the fronts the surgical front as well as the medical front. So we, we keep on doing all these things that we are doing at the present time, but we, we must be able to differentiate between primarily done RPLND and a secondarily done residual disease dissection. So that's my, uh, my take on the subject. Uh, just to add a few points to this, uh, the uh, whatever we discussed is um, a very standard approach that is practiced in the world where people are picked up at, at very early stages where the diagnostic modalities are very efficient. And these are the templates that are done even when there are there is N0, when stage one cancer is there. So we did what we did not discuss is uh, the advanced disease uh, beyond stage 2B. So there will be a time when uh, the disease uh, moves towards the advanced stages and obviously the bulk will increase and there will be a um, uh, um, problem with the function of nerves somehow. So this is a double-edged sword uh, because in the Western countries, you know, uh, there are always problems with the uh, suing or uh, 
with the complications and patients are very well informed so they need to be told that it that whether uh, you, you see uh, in a stage one there is no disease in the retroperitoneum basically but we are just clearing the lymph nodes so we need to tell them that if they go for the surgery at this stage the function can get compromised but they have a chance that th this can be spared with more meticulous dissections or depending on the center that is doing or the surgeon that is doing the surgery but as the disease progresses so it becomes difficult and more difficult even in the post chemotherapy rpl and uh, with the nerve fibrosis and um, and everything it's more difficult to preserve the super superior hypogastric plexus uh, I, I want to respond to this thing. Uh, very well explanation. The post chemotherapy RPL and D, uh, it is uh, it doesn't depend on the pre chemo ma size of uh, mass. The chemo is very sensitive in non seminomatous or seminomatous gem cell tumor. Number one. Number two. After chemo or radio, there is desmoplastic reaction to the lymph nodes because this platinum based chemotherapy. This gliomycin, sofsamide, it acts directly on the germ cells which are mutated, which can cause the desmoplastic reaction and which can cause the adhesions and further fibrosis around the node and the necrosis inside the node. Or it can also have the residual tumor inside it. Number, and the second thing is that. And third thing is that uh, with, uh, the template section doesn't depend on the pre or cacne and uh, si and uh, nodal size, uh, nodal stage. It depends on post chemotherapy residual mass only. If it is more than three centimeter, no matter what it is of ten centimeter, it is involving the kidney. You have to take it out by salvaging the whole kidney or by salvaging the ureter. You have to take it out. Uh, and uh, the what Professor Asasa had had told us about the bladder neck incontinence or retrograde ejaculation. If they are uh, their preservation as you have told in your presentation their preservation is secondary but uh, the for the counseling of patient any patient which come late or in early stage of testicular tumor he uh, he should be counseled about the retrograde ejaculation and incontinence due to tumor and after the chemotherapy and after the surgery it can happen at any time very well uh, explained presentation thank you Sir, uh, is there any difference in surgical technique in case of uh, nerve preservation in RPLND, like in open surgical surgical technique for RPLND as well as in laparoscopy? <clears throat> I think there, there must be a, a difference, and there must also be a difference when you do a robotic surgery. Um, but I'm still not very uh, much uh, clear about it. Um, I haven't been through uh, that kind of uh, approach uh, in any of the videos or uh, anyone who has done it, but people are doing it and uh, laparoscopically it's difficult and that is the reason why robot is being placed into that area. Robot is being placed into that area because of two reasons. One is the stereotactic vision that is available to the robot. You can have a 10x uh, magnification of the whole area and uh, the depth perception is much more uh, as compared to a laparoscopic procedure uh, or uh, an open procedure. So you'll be able to um, define your boundaries more clearer. Um, that, that is again my assumption. I have been through into that uh, area through a robot, robotic eye. The second thing is the dexterity. The dexterity is very much, um, uh, I think, uh, with, the, with the robot and the areas between the nerve fibers which you want to clear is much easier with the dexterous um, capability of the robotic arm as compared to a laparoscopic arm or um, or or through an open technique when you're doing it yourself through the instruments so uh, again the, these are all assumptions but people are doing it so that means that they have got an advantage and since they have got an advantage so a robotic surgery, whether it is done in the pelvis for prostate or whether it is done in, in the retroperitoneum for this kind of uh, procedure, it uh, surely differentiates the nerves. It surely uh, knows where you have to uh, dissect um, uh, your plane. So uh, I think that that is the way forward for all of us, for our unit. Uh, unless and until you, you put a benchmark, you put a 
mark that this is the point where you want to uh, reach um then there there is no point in doing any kind of uh, technological tool available to you so uh, that is again a wish that since we have got a robot we must put a benchmark that this is the point that we, we want to reach for instance your your group if you put your hands into it for uh, for different kind of purpose maybe you are doing um, transplant you are you do transplant through robot then this is the same place if you extend it you are into the retroperitoneum you will have a more clearer understanding as compared to somebody else who is going a trans transperitoneal surgery so a retroperitoneal and transperitoneal these are two different kind of surgeon groups in in my uh, understanding so they they can have a different kind of approach they can have a different kind of uh, planning and they can produce good results so think about it so world is giving you an opportunity in a different way out of the box yes. <laughs> exercise so uh, that that is uh, i think we we can um, do this kind of uh, discussion sometime else also and uh, today it was a very good uh, discussion healthy discussion so everything uh, all the questions have been answered so thank you very much